So, um, do you want to do this in Norwegian or English? <laughs> Why don't we start in English? <laughs> <laughs> slowly. Yeah, go. slowly bring in the Norwegian. Yeah. So, uh, I'm very happy that you uh, want to give this interview. Yeah. My intention with asking you is that I want to further familiarize the Norwegian community of psychotherapists with a deliberate practice. Great. And uh, you know, this is Tony Romanier. He wrote a book Hi. called The Delib Deliberate Practice for Psychotherapists. Yeah. Came out last year yeah. on Rutledge. Or Rutledge, yeah. Rutledge, yeah. Uh -huh. So um, maybe we should just start off with you telling us a little bit about what deliberate practice is in psychotherapy. Sure. So deliberate practice originally uh, was a term used to describe how uh, professionals achieve competence and an expertise across a whole bunch of other fields, yeah. right? Like so athletics, music, chess, piloting, many fields. Yeah. And recently, uh, a number of psychologists have been exploring uh, how can we use deliberate practice to improve psychotherapy. Mm. Uh, Scott Miller was the first psychologist to really you know, dig into this. Uh, when was that? When was that? Maybe about 10 years or so okay. ago. Uh, he, he started writing about it a lot. Yeah. Um, and then uh, more recently, I co-edited a book with himself and Bruce Wampold and Rod Goodyear, and there's more and more psychologists looking into this as well. Yeah. So what is it about? What so, yeah. so there's a few things we do with deliberate practice that are a little different than traditional clinical training. Yeah. So one of them is that um, we focus on specific micro skills that are just beyond the therapist's uh, ability, mm. right? So typically in psychotherapy, we've talked about broad concepts. Mm. So try to have a better working alliance, yeah. right? Or try to help the client have more motivation. Mm. And, and those are good, those are important, mm. but they're really broad. Yeah, it, it, It's hard to... Uh, to know exactly how to practice that. Yeah, and to right? operationalize it. To operationalize it, yeah. exactly. And so with deliberate practice, we would pick a very, very specific skill within that. Yeah. So, uh, for example, uh, when the client is talking uh, about uh, their trauma and they start to all of a sudden not trust you as much, mm. here are some skills to uh, make the alliance stronger mm. in that specific moment. Mm. Yeah. Right. So it's not necessarily focusing on one model of psychotherapy and not necessarily focusing only on the patient, but uh, has a more focus also on, uh, on the therapist. Yeah. So yeah. deliberate practice is a transmodal theory of training. Yeah. So you could use it across all the models. You could use it within a model mm. as well. Yeah. Um, but the general principles apply across all the models. Yeah. Now, uh, what we've also found is as we focus more and more specifically on certain skills, we've discovered that therapists often need help building their psychological capacity yeah. to use those skills. Yeah. So for example, uh, if a therapist is helping a client uh, who has a lot of trauma, mm. uh, and the client is describing the trauma, it, the therapist himself can start to experience some of the feelings from the trauma, mm. can spark start to have what we call experiential avoidance. Yeah. So almost uh, unintentionally avoiding yeah. the trauma. And so another thing we focus on deli in deliberate practice is helping uh, therapists build the psychological capacity to use the skills, particularly with clients uh, that are very emotionally uh, evocative. Yeah, so, and can you say a little bit, little bit more about the experiential avoidance? Is it, yeah. Yeah, so I can give you an example uh, from you know my practice. Yeah. Um, I uh, there's uh, some kinds of clients that, um, for example, when I'm working with a male client who gets very angry with me. Yeah. Right. This happens from time to time. Yeah. And it's not that the client's doing anything wrong, or even necessarily I'm doing something wrong, mm -hmm. but it's just part of the process sometimes. Mm -hmm. However, the uh, when people get angry at me, I, I get some anxiety, I, I get some nervous reaction. Mm. Now, if I'm not careful, I will unintentionally do things to avoid that experience. Yeah. So I might try to change the subject. I might try to convince the client to not be angry at me. Yeah. I might start teaching or philosophizing or basically doing anything yeah. to avoid the client's uh, uh, feelings. Yeah. 
right? So yeah, unintentionally. Unintentionally, and then and, and, and maybe also uh, like uh, unconsciously. Unconsciously, like, but yeah. And I found that I would do this even though I had good, really good supervisors pointing this out to me. Yeah, I would show them a video of my work, um, where I had unintentionally uh, started teaching the client in some way that wasn't helpful or changing the subject, yeah. my supervisor would say, hey, Tony, you know, why don't you instead uh, help the client explore their feelings? Yeah. You know, And I'd go in with the intention of doing that, but then I would unintentionally, unconsciously start you know, changing the subject again or whatever. Yeah. And so what we've been experimenting with doing is how can we use deliberate practice to help therapists kind of practice those skills enough and build their psychological capacity to actually implement the advice they're getting from supervisors. Yeah, because if you, if you avoid the experience, like if the therapist avoids the experience, yeah. the, the, the patient uh, also loses the opportunity to, right. to experience it. Right, and this yeah. is something, it's a very hard part of being a therapist that I don't think we acknowledge enough in the field well. is so, you know, a lot of us do some form of exposure as yeah. part of our therapy, yeah. right? And almost every model does yeah. some form of exposure, right? We might use different terms for it. Mm. And so we're helping a client um, build their tolerance for an experience, uh, build their kind of emotional, psychological, adaptive response to an experience, mm. right? Mm. But as part of the exposure, the therapist is going to feel it too. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Because we're attuned with the client. Yeah. Which is good. We're supposed to be attuned with the client, right? Yeah. Yeah. In fact, if we stop attuning with the client, they notice and the alliance breaks, right? Yeah. yeah. But the problem is, is we haven't been given the skills, the tools to be able to build our capacity to stay attuned while the client is having exposure. Mm. Right? Yeah. It's almost like training firemen to run into a burning building to save people, yeah. but never talking about the fear they're going to experience while doing it. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, and nice picture. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so um, I also wonder, I mean, um, after I've, have, uh, having reading your book, having yeah. read your book, I, uh, I'm, I'm, I noticed that you, your vantage point almost is the statistics in the outcome, yeah. in, in a way. Yeah. It's like 50, you notice that yeah. 50 percent of our cases yeah. are going quite well. Yeah. But the re, uh, the other 50. Yeah. Uh, so some of them are non-responders. Yeah. Stalled processes. Right. Deterioration. Right. Um, and this is very this is a very common outcome statistic across yeah. models and across therapists. Yeah. Um, and I uh, and the deliberate practice is a is a way of trying to change that statistic. Yeah. Uh, specifically, also by studying uh, the mistakes, like the, yeah, how can we how can we engage in this without systematically devaluating our own work? If oh. You know what I mean? oh, that's a really good question. Okay, I mean this is an important question: is if we take an honest, open look at our work, yeah, is it okay? Yeah, if we see our failures, yeah. Because when I was going through school, I was trying to prove to everyone how good I was. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I mean, I wanted to pass school, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? And then after I graduated, it's not like I want to go around telling everyone about my mistakes. Mm. And when you go to workshops, people aren't talking all about their mistakes. No, they don't. Right? They're talking about how great their yeah. model is, how great their successes are. Yeah. I've heard some leaders of some models claim 100% success, which oh, is just great. <laughs> it's a like great fantasy, <laughs> but it's not reality. No, I, it's not reality at all, yeah. right? But if you're not collecting outcome data, it's easy to go into that yeah. fantasy, yeah. right? I started collecting my own outcome data because I, it kind of helps me stay grounded in reality. Yeah. And, uh, you know, at, at different points in my career, it's been more or less, but there, there's been points where I'm helping 50% or fewer mm. of my clients. Mm. Now... First of all, that compares favorably to many medical treatments. Yeah. It's just important that we remember. Yeah, this is a nice point, a nice point I think. Yeah. yeah, and we're helping people with you know, serious depression, serious anxiety, eating disorders, I mean, suicide. I mean, these are really serious, very dangerous uh, conditions. Yeah. People have often had for decades. And I would say a 50% success rate is really good, mm. especially because it's very low cost mm. compared to, you know, many or most medical treatments. Yeah. All right. So first of all, it's important, I think, that we feel good about that. Yeah. But in deliberate practice, we take what's called a failure facing approach, okay, yeah. which means we aim for a point of failure. We aim just beyond our ability. Yeah. Let me put it this way. So if you play a sport, right? 
Well, imagine get. Let's say you played football. You're a professional football player, mm. but you never got to find out the score of any of your games. Mm. <laughs> how good did? You would have some fantasy about how good you are, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it wouldn't be tied to reality. No, true. Right? No. Imagine if you never got to find out how good anyone else was, mm. and so you were just kind of playing these games on your own without any score, not knowing anything else. I mean, you would have no idea of really what you needed to improve. Mm. This actually this taps into the next question. I guess, yeah. Actually. Because uh, well, in in your book you describe that we we have a crisis in our yeah. clinical culture. Yeah. Uh, what crisis? So uh, imagine uh, here's another example. Yeah. Imagine you're trained to be a painter. Yeah. And uh, you never showed your paintings to anyone. Mm. Instead, you just went to painting teachers and said you described your painting. Mm. You said, well, I used a lot of red here and a lot of blue here, but maybe it was too much blue. What do you think? Mm. How much good feedback do you think you could get? Zero. Yeah. Now imagine you never looked at anyone else's paintings as well. Mm. That's the situation that many therapists are in. Mm. Is we don't uh, videotape our work, we don't watch our own work, and then we don't show our own work to others. Mm. We don't collect our own outcome data. We don't read about other people's outcome data. Yeah. I mean, we read about clinical trials, but those are these carefully constructed environments that yeah. really have very little relationship to our natural, re regular therapist work, yeah. right? Mm. And, and so we're not, we don't have a good, grounded, realistic view of our work, of other people's works, and then also how to improve. Mm. Mm. And, and I would suggest we should aim to be more like sports. Yeah. Or music, yeah. or or um, chess, or almost every other field, mm. where we're much more open about our work, mm. and there's ways to do that to protect confidentiality, mm. right? There's ethical ways to do that, yeah. and uh, we're much more open about oh, here are my mistakes, here's my growth edge, and how can I work on that? Yeah. So, but but how can how can we? I mean, uh, in deliberate practice, at least yeah. my impression is. But uh, when we find mistakes and stalled processes, yeah, we should we we are uh, kind of happy and curious, yeah, not, not uh, shameful and self-critical. Yeah, well, that's a yeah. great opportunity when you yeah. see that. Yeah, exactly. Like mm. if if I can't see my mistakes, then I don't know how to improve. And so I need to see my really. I need to show my videos to someone else. Yeah. So they can point out my mistakes. Yeah. And crucially, this should be a career-long process. Yeah. Professional athletes don't stop going to practice when they join a team. No, no. <laughs> right? If anything, they practice more. Yeah, yeah. Professional musicians don't stop practicing when they get hired into a symphony. Mm. They actually practice more. Yeah. Right? Mm. Professional pilots keep practicing. They get feedback throughout their whole career. Mm. Professional chess players, everyone. So we should do the same. If we want to get better. Yeah. Yeah, we're not... Well, look, is psychotherapy easier than athletics? No. no it's, is it simpler than flying? No, it's quite the opposite. I would argue that it is harder and more complex, complex than all of those fields. Yeah. And I would say we need feedback on our work even more. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's incredible this what we've been asking ourselves to improve without getting continual feedback throughout our career. Mm. And the problem is, is it can get demoralizing because therapists, because we have a culture of that, yeah. therapists can think that somehow they should be getting better even though they're not getting feedback. Mm. Yeah. And that can be depressing when it doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. So, um, um, I also wonder, well, hopefully, or I think maybe you are also experiencing when you are traveling around the world that yeah. the, uh, the therapist community uh, they are curious about this approach. Yeah. Um, what uh, what is your advice to people that might be seeing this that uh, that might get curious about the uh, delivery yeah. practice? Yeah. So the response has been very positive. I mean, the cool thing about being a therapist, we all become therapists because we want to help people. Yeah. Right? No one becomes a therapist because they want to be rich or no. they don't stay in the field very long if that's their goal, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, because we want to help people. We want to get better at helping people. Yeah. The good news is it is possible to do that. Mm. So start recording your work. Find a consultant or supervisor or uh, colleagues you admire. Mm. 
get their feedback on your work. Mm -hmm. Uh, try to figure out some specific skills you can work on mm -hmm. just beyond your ability. Yeah. You can try then try to practice those skills. Yeah, and this is a part. Uh, this is a, not to interrupt, but this, yeah. this is a part that hasn't been highlighted yet. Yeah, the solitary part, the solitary practice part. Yeah, it doesn't have to be solitary. Okay. It could be with a colleague yeah. or in a small group. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, it typically uh, some kind of practice routine um, where you are uh, you're engaging in behavior rehearsal yeah. of the skills. Yeah. Building your psychological capacity to use the skills with challenging cases, yeah, and then see that as a career-long process. Yeah, yeah, good. So we are almost out of time. Okay. Final, the final question is that is, uh, well, do you have any final comments for the Norwegian uh, psychotherapist community that that might be uh, curious? I think it's great if if you're curious. That's wonderful. Yeah. Uh, I would, uh, in, uh, if there's a voice inside you saying, I want to be better, mm. that's wonderful. Mm. Um, I would listen to that and uh, record your work and get some feedback on your work. Yeah. So, uh, so I'm developing some exercises we're going to be putting on YouTube. Yeah. Uh, so I can provide help. Uh, Scott Miller does a bunch of help in this. Mm. Um, John Fredrickson mm. uh, has delivered practice ex exercises. Daryl Chow is a psychologist in Australia now. Yeah. Who uh, and there's more and more of us. Okay. So. Good. So um, thank you very much. It's sure. been a pleasure talking to you. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you. <laughs>